This is a production of Cornell University. So I'm happy to be here to talk to you about communication and climate change. It's necessarily a 10,000 foot view look into these. I'm going to be talking about um, a fair amount of research and pre presenting some examples along the way. Um, if you have any questions along the way, please raise your hand and ask them all um, from time to time. Be interested to see if you have any comments on anything that I've said. And so with that, I will launch into it. And welcome to all of you that are on WebEx. <laughs> So I was asked to speak about this larger challenge of climate change communication. And in particular, I thought it would be interesting, and because it's a topic that we're all uh, paying attention to now, is why in the face of scientific evidence do people continue to deny the existence of climate change and refute policy action? And I think that this is the 10,000 or $10 million or maybe $10 billion question. And, uh, and there's probably a lot of answers out there. I don't know if anybody has an, an idea. Just sort of toss it out there. Why, why do you think that this is the case? Anybody? Money. OK, money is one. Anything else? Fear. Fear, another one. Others? Scope. scope, the scope of the problem. Others? Politics. Politics, thanks. Anybody else in the back? How about any, anybody in the back? Disengagement? <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Lack of, substantial Lack of substantial link to human causes. Great. Anything else? Well, let me uh, prime the pump a little bit. Here are just a few of the factors that we might say are connected to that challenge of why in the face of overwhelming scientific consensus do people continue to deny the existence of climate change or refute policy action. And although I won't go through each of these in turn, I can assure you that there's been research on all of these aspects and how they each can play a role. Um, and indeed, this list is probably not exhaustive. But let me summarize it a little bit to say that in communication, we often think about aspects um, as characteristics of the audience, the message, the source, and the channel, the social, the cultural, the economic, and political context, and the nature of the risk or the issue itself can all influence responses to, in this case, climate change communication. And so as scientists, when we look at these, um, at these issues, we, we often look to deconstruct and really try to understand what is it about the audience? What is it about the receiver of that information that influences their response to information? What is it about the way that the message is constructed, the format of the message? What is it about the source and the credibility of the source and the channel, which we um, use to talk about media, um, interpersonal or mass mediated? And then looking at these broader drivers of the social context, our interpersonal, our group dynamics, um, our work dynamics, our friends, our peers, cultural dynamics, economic dynamics, we mentioned, somebody mentioned cost, and politics. And then thinking about the characteristics itself of this risk, the characteristics of climate change, and what does climate change look like? How do we grasp and get a handle on that? How do we describe climate change, and how does that influence? So these are all aspects that we might unpack at, and as scientists look at each one of these. But today, I'm going to, um, again, just touch on a few things among these. I'd like to provide an overview of US public opinion on climate change. And I'm going to focus specifically on the United States. Um, during the Q&A, if you have some questions, I might be able to, to mention a little bit about other, other countries. But today, I'm going to focus primarily on US public opinion and then go into some research that looks at why a partisan divide um, might be existing. And then think about some of the path forward, or are there ways forward to, to bridge this divide, as it were? So first, um, the data. One of the things about climate change is that because it's so fascinating, and, and I'm using climate change at this point to be synonymous with global warming or global climate change, 
Um, but when we think about climate change, there's been so much research on public opinion and related to it. So I'm going to be sharing some data that I've pulled from sources. Gallup is a, is a public opinion polling service. I'm also going to um, pull some polls from uh, the Yale Climate Change Communication and Pew Research Center. So um, these are, are polls that have been um, nationally conducted, and I'll try to give you a little bit of information about the sample as we go along. But just to start off with, and here is a, a poll from Gallup that has asked a, a US nationally representative sample of 18 and older um, adults, please tell me if you personally worry about this problem a great deal, a fair amount, only a little, or not at all. And in this respect, it's global warming or climate change. And so you can look at, over time, the, um, the percentage, at which has had some highs and some lows. Let me try to get this mouse. Um, but here we are at around 2015, um, with overall about 55% worry a great deal or a fair amount um, about climate change. Here is a, another question, and this is, this is actually a, a pretty key question in, in understanding whether or not people uh, believe that climate change is happening, and that's the extent um, to which they believe scientists are, have a consensus that it's happening. So here's another question from Gallup. Just your impression, which of the following statements do you think is most accurate? Most scientists believe that global warming is occurring, is not occurring, or they're unsure. And so here again is the um, overall US uh, sample percentage where you have about 60%, 62 um, at, to 60% in 2014 um, agree that it is occurring. Um, indeed, you have about 29% that say unsure. But overall, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, over, it's a majority. But now let's talk about the divide. And in this, I'm going to talk uh, specifically about political party and ideology. And it's not meant to, um, to beat up on a particular political party or not. These ideological divides are often relate, uh, are related very closely to people's identities. It, it tends to be that they can map on into uh, political party identification or um, I political ideology identification. So these are used as proxies, if you will, for some core values. But, um, and they're often measured in, that, in the manner of, of Democrat and Republican. So here is, a, here is some survey uh, data from the Pew Research Center. And this is, again, a national opinion um, survey. And in this, you can look at on the, um, on the left side, yes, on the left side, um, the percentage that's saying that protecting the environment is important. And so you have about 66% uh, of Democrats saying that protecting the environment is important, whereas Republicans, you've got about 35% in 2015. And then in dealing with global warming, you've got 50% of Democrats saying that this is a top priority and you've got 15% of Republicans. Um, independents come in the middle. And so you're seeing that suddenly this majority is actually um, much more divided when you, when you parse it along party lines. Um, this is another set of interesting data, and I had a lot of fun with this one. Um, this is on the, uh, as I mentioned, Yale has a climate change communication product, uh, project. And they've, uh, these maps show the national uh, public opinion about this issue, and then you can parse it into state and congressional district. And so you can again start to see where some of these divides are occurring. So this is the national average, the estimated percentage of adults who think global warming is happening in 2014. You've got 63%. And then as you go into uh, the state level, um, as you get toward the lighter yellow, um, it starts to get uh, into less belief that it's happening. And then as you go into the congressional district, again, you, you get these divides. So um, within even states, uh, there are, there are uh, differences among whether or not people believe that climate change is happening. Even so, in this case, or excuse me, global warming is happening. In this case, we've got mostly uh, everybody is above the 50%. Um, this one is the estimated percentage of adults who think global warming is mostly caused by human activities. So this is, this is a, key, um, a key point. And on national, we've got 
uh, agree with that. But as you go into the state level, um, you can see that some states think that it's higher. Um, California is over here, and it's in the uh, 55 plus range. But then you've got states like, um, like Oklahoma, where I'm from, uh, which is getting down into the uh, 35 to 40 percent. And then again, as you go into uh, the congressional district, you also get um, more variety. And then finally, here is another map that I pulled. The percentage of adults who believe that most scientists think global warming is happening. The national average is 41 percent um, of adults who think that it's happening. And as you go into states, you can see that as we get cooler and cooler, I guess the blue is sort of nice, people are cooling on that idea, um, that it gets lower and lower among certain states. Um, with, with some pockets of higher belief around larger cities. So that gives you an example of some of the, the data that, that is representative of a lot of data that shows that there are these divides in belief that it's occurring. And so um, the next few slides I'd like to, to uh, present you with some ideas about why. You know, why is that the case? And so, as I mentioned, audience factors or individual factors are one of the key things that um, communication researchers look at, um, looking at psychological research on um, individual uh, differences. And the first one I'd like to talk about that's been looked at a lot is this idea of motivated reasoning. And um, so for, for a long time, people had the simplistic notion that if we just provide people with the information about anything, in this case climate science, but anything, that people will accept that information. And indeed, we often hear this uh, with scientists who want to just increase scientific literacy. We hear a lot about scientific literacy. And scientific literacy, few would argue against increasing knowledge about how science is conducted. But just thinking that if people know more about the science, that they will then think like the scientists um, or agree with the scientists is very um, simplistic reasoning. And in fact, it doesn't happen that way in reality, or at least with a lot of people. Because of this idea, um, not only, but because of this idea of motivated reasoning, which is that when information comes in, it is filtered through our own attitudes and our beliefs and our emotions and our values in, in a way that leads us to accept or reject information. And um, so it, it suggests a very activated or motivated processing of information as it comes in. And this has been um, identified and studied in the psychological literature. It's been picked up and written about in some of the more popular and mainstream press. I have a picture um, of an article by Chris Mooney that was in Discover Magazine where he uh, related the science of why we don't believe in science. So motivated reasoning has been um, looked at as one of the prime explanatory factors for why people can hear information about climate change and, and reject it. And in climate change in particular, political ideology has often been located as an important motivator for this. So I'd like to present you with one study that shows this example. So Saul Hart and Eric Nisbet, who are actually also Cornell alums uh, from, from my department, um, conducted a study where they exposed uh, uh, over 200 national adults to the same set of messages. They altered um, one aspect in relation to uh, who were the victims of climate change, whether they were near to the, to the respondent or whether they were far away. But they were essentially the same set of messages and uh, otherwise, and they were interested in how exposure to these messages influenced support for climate change. And what they found was that among Democrats and Republicans, there were these opposite effects, that the Democrats, irrespective of whether you um, mentioned you know, near or far, they were more likely to support the climate change mitigation policies, but Democrats were completely less likely to, uh, to do so. And this shows this, uh, this dotted line with the triangle is the control, no message. So when somebody didn't get any message at all, it was pretty much um, flat. 
But when you, when the Republicans heard the message, any message at all, they they decreased their support for climate change policy. And this is again um, a, an often cited study that supports motivated reasoning around climate change, where two groups or individuals can get the same message and um, vastly uh, have different responses to it. Um, this is another neat set of data that are coming out of uh, the Cultural Cognitions Project. Uh, Dan Kahan out of Yale, uh, who's come a few times to Cornell, is doing this, and this is in relation to the, uh, in, in collaboration with the Annenberg Center for Public Policy. And in particular, what I really like about this one is because it gets at that issue that if people just understood the science, then they would agree that it's happening. Because if we look here um, on, on the right graph, um, what they've done is they've modified the way that the question is asked. And on the right side of the graph, or excuse me, the left side, um, the question was asked, what gas do most scientists believe causes temperatures in the atmosphere to rise? Is it hydrogen, helium, carbon dioxide, or radon? And the, um, the y-axis is the probability of the correct answer. And you can see here that irrespective of whether the respondents are Republicans or Democrats, um, they can get the correct answer. They get the correct answer. They, they understand. Or at least it doesn't break down on party lines, their climate literacy. But when you ask it in, this, in the manner on the right side, is the Earth getting warmer, mostly because of human activities such as burning fossil fuels, or mostly because of natural patterns in the Earth's atmosphere, and the correct answer being A, um, you can see that you suddenly get this divide where the, the Democrats are more likely to agree that it's occurring due to human activity, but the conservative Republicans are less likely to. And so this is, again, used as an example for how motivated reasoning is causing um, two groups of people or people to see that same information and to have vastly different responses because it cuts at their core values if you will, their core identity. And that's what's um, been projected as, or speculated as it's causing uh, conservatives to reject these messages because they, they somehow um, uh, constrain the individual freedoms. So again, this is an, an example of how just, it's not always about knowledge. It's not that people just don't know what's happening. It's that they reject it because it goes against their core beliefs. So let's talk again about some more information about what contributes to this divide. And so sources of information, who do people go for information? And again, I've got to go back to my, my US senator from Oklahoma, good old Jim Inhofe, who is the chair of the Senate Environment and Public Works. Do people trust, uh, and, and a, a very well-known climate change denier, uh, do people believe Al Gore? Um, Nobel or Peace Prize for uh, Inconvenient Truth? Uh, do people believe our wonderful Bill Nye, uh, the science guy in terms of climate change? Well, Sarah Palin certainly doesn't, if you guys saw this last week. Uh, climate change denier Sarah Palin. Bill Nye is as much a scientist as I am. So, uh, or the Pope, the Pope. Well, the Pope, uh, we've got the Francis effect. People are talking about the Pope Francis effect. Um, whether or not you're Catholic, you, you may have heard that uh, Pope Francis came out with a, an encyclical on, on climate change, that it's occurring and that we need to do something. We need to act now. And, and it had a bump on belief in climate change. Um, and, and people are studying it as the Francis effect. So uh, here are just some data, again, from Catholics and non-Catholics. But um, among Catholics, I strongly, moderately trust Pope Francis as an information source about global warming, 77%. So thinking again about these sources of information, and, and you know, you could have uh, Sarah Palin just as well tweet about the Pope being as much a scientist as she is. And maybe that's a little bit closer than, than Bill Nye. Um, but that said, in some ways it really doesn't matter because it's about who people trust for information. And they're gonna trust people who they believe share their values, are like them, that are caring and compassionate, in addition to being experts um, and being competent 
but that's in addition to, it's not only expertise and competence, but it's also these factors of, does this person share my values? Um, so let's talk a, about another aspect, uh, media coverage. And I want to preface this by saying that um, media coverage is often blamed for a lot of what goes on in the world. But as I hope I've, I've laid the foundation for saying that just because something is said, or just because it occurs in the media, it doesn't mean that you, you, um, you incorporate it, you believe it, that you turn around and, and sort of swallow it, hook, line, and sinker, as they would say. We are always selectively filtering information. That said, um, media coverage um, has had some tendencies that people have, researchers pointed to, that could contribute to this partisan divide. So back to some larger statistics. Here's, here's Gallup, and this is, uh, I, uh, this is not broken down by partisan, um, but this is uh, Americans, US Americans, rate the seriousness of, of global warming. And the question is, thinking about what is said in the news, in your view, is the seriousness of global warming generally exaggerated, generally correct, or is it generally underestimated? And so this is asking people what they think about news coverage of global warming. And here, it's sort of interesting that the most respondents think in 2014 that the news on global warming, warming is generally exaggerated. Um, that's 42%. 33% say it's generally underestimated. 23% um, generally correct. And so again, most thought that it was exaggerated. But if we look at this and break it down by political affiliation, once again, we see this divide occurring. And so if we look at this scale, and, um, and it's essentially that same question, um, that Republicans, 68% are likely to say it's generally exaggerated, whereas 18% of Democrats are likely to say it's generally exaggerated. Um, and in comparison, going to the opposite end of the spectrum, 15% are likely to say, of Republicans are likely to say it's generally underestimated, whereas 49% of Democrats are. So again, what's occurring here? Are they, are they reading different sources? Well, yeah. But not only is that the reason. Not only is that the reason. Again, because of selective filtering and motivated reasoning, um, people can read the same news story and hear or believe or perceive something different. Um, here I'm going to talk about a classic study, though, uh, that looks at how national newspapers have tended to cover climate change. And some of you may have heard about this false balance um, conundrum, that there is a norm of objectivity, a norm of, of journalism, to present both sides of an issue uh, in, as they write stories. And there's been a lot of hand-wringing that's been done over the years saying, you know, why, why for so long was uh, climate change um, presented in a balance that if you said that it was happening, that it was being caused by human factors, why did, they, why did journalists feel the need to go out and, and find somebody who said, but natural causes could also be occurring? So this is a, cl a classic account um, by Boykoff and Boykoff. Um, in 2004, so it's a while back now, that's showing that indeed this um, largest piece of the pie, when they did a content analysis, that means they studied media coverage in, in these large national newspapers of record, um, they did a content analysis and they found that over 50% or 52% of the articles that they studied that talked about climate change presented a balance. So they said anthropogenic, but also some say that maybe there's not. And so they, they found this, um, they found evidence for this balance. And so many have argued that that led to the continuing belief that scientists did not have a consensus about climate change or that it was occurring. And as I mentioned earlier, belief in a consensus among the scientific community is a key factor that predicts support for mitigation activities. And so indeed, this research suggests that early on, um, the media might have contributed to this uncertainty or belief in uncertainty um, among scientists. Now, if we fast forward today, uh, there is additional research suggesting that, that this type of, of false balance, if you will, is much less present and is all but um, 
disappeared, but it's still, again, in the mainstream newspapers. Um, although one can argue that there are other ways to talk about balance and, and conflict and controversy about adaptation or mitigation um, that can, again, present sides as being less in consensus than they are. And I just thought this was an interesting, I just pulled this um, off of an example of, of what such a, a, a sort of strange balance might look like. Um, and this uh, it comes off as a title. This was a few years ago. UN scientists, the headline, climate change evidence unequivocal. And so it's hard to get much bolder than that. But then as you read toward, through the article and then you get to the end, here is, here is that, that where that sort of false balance creeps in. Scientists who are skeptical of the severity of global warming contend that there's no way to measure the impact of human activity on climate and that no one knows how much warming will occur or how it might affect the Earth. Some experts suggest that global warming may be part of natural climate cycles that humans can do little about. And so that, that almost insidious um, aspect that's put in there, that could be a throwaway comment, but yet that's an example of how this idea of unequivocal, but yet, um, and this norm um, in journalism uh, this, that might have perpetuated uh, the, co the continuing belief that there was less scientific consensus or is more scientific uncertainty than there is. So as I mentioned, there are aspects. I, I don't want to use journalists as um, uh, you know, beat up on journalists. Indeed, I, I, um, I think that uh, true journalists are some of the most ethical and um, hardworking professionals that I, that I know. I mean, it's not just because I might teach a future uh, generation of them. But there has been a lot of uh, research and re writing about the culture of journalism. And, and uh, one that I've always enjoyed over the years is written by Dorothy Nelkin, actually founded the Science and Technology Studies Department here at Cornell, um, and uh, called Selling Science. This is, these are not necessarily unique to science journalism, but she wrote about the culture of science journalism and the importance that um, writers develop a style and that you make the, the, st the science interesting with drama and human interest and oddity and conflict. And this is again about um, selling science, making it more exciting, telling a story. And then again, the norms of objectivity and balance which we see throughout journalists that they might strive to be neutral and unbiased in their reporting by presenting multiple points of view. Um, I'd like to talk for a moment about the, the uniqueness or, or perhaps the um, particulars about environmental issues that might lead more of the drama or conflict or hype to come in to play. And this goes back to a um, to an essay written by Anthony Downs in 1972 that looked at up and down in the issue attention cycle, up and down with the environment, the issue attention cycle. And Downs hypothesized that environmental issues in particular were going to be prone to cyclical coverage. That is, uh, there would be a pre-problem stage, and these are the five stages that he put in, a pre-problem stage where it might be known about but there isn't a whole lot of attention to it. And then there would be an alarm discovery phase associated with specific environmental problems or hazard, where there'd be an increased amount and of attention. Then at some point, the realization of the costs of solving that problem would come into play, which would start to precipitate a decrease in attention to this. And then there would be a gradual decline of intense public interest and a post-problem phase, where the issue was a higher than in the pre-problem phase, but yet there would be less attention to it. And you can look at this in relation to thinking about all of the issues that are competing any day for space in our attention, in our day-to-day -day attention, much less the media attention, and what causes them to, to rise and to fall. Um, one day we might see, or one week, we might see a heck of a lot of coverage about a particular topic, and the next week it's been supplanted by something else. And um, we did a study a few years ago that looked at this. This just shows you the, the cycle um, in looking at uh, coverage of global climate change in the New York Times and the Washington Post from 1980 to 1995. And we content analyzed the coverage. We wanted to know what content was appeared in these different periods of this cycle of attention. And so here you can see what we've identified as the pre-problem stage. Um, where there was very low and little attention. And then the alarm discovery phase, where there was heightened 
attention, and then the realization of cost, decline in interest, and post problem. And what we found in the content is that in this extreme um, rapid increase, that the content was most likely to talk about the consequences, um, the vast consequences of climate change that could occur, but that when we had this realization in, of cost and decline in interest, the content in these newspaper articles was most likely to talk about how much it was going to cost, how much we would have to sacrifice to do it. And we, we speculated that there, were, there was sort of a meta-narrative, if you will, a, a larger, larger story going on about how climate change was, was socially constructed or constructed by those journalists um, during this period of time that might have, um, at that time, led to a, almost a cry wolf in the post uh, problem stage, um, and, and again, this is 1995. There's been studies since then which have looked at issue attention cycles um, in climate change as well as others, and, and again, it's, it's been shown to, uh, to be a common type of, of way that these issues are covered. Um, and this kind of gets at a point that I made earlier on to say that the nature of the risk, the nature of climate change, to what extent does that have a role? in the partisan divide or the believability or the hype, if you will. And this goes back to what Downs said again, that he, he said that environmental issues in particular are experienced unequally and not enough people suffer directly to maintain attention to this issue. That environmental problems are caused by social arrangements that benefit a majority or a powerful minority and that they're not intrinsically exciting enough or fade with time. And so um, I, I thought that the cartoon with the frogs there that are sitting in the water um, as it boils around them and they're not sure, <laughs> they don't realize that it's boiling until it's too late. It's this idea that is the environment itself not intrinsically exciting enough? It's hard enough to sort of grasp and get our, get our hands on so that we don't pay attention to it that much. And so journalists, in order to get us to pay attention to it, are more likely to hype and come up with the exciting content, the dramatic content, the conflict, the controversy, the debate. And so when we looked at the data earlier that showed that a lot of people thought that the media might exaggerate these issues, indeed, one could argue that they're doing that for the very reason that these issues are not that exciting to begin with. Um, again, one might argue that. I'm not sure that there are some in the room that would agree with that. Um, but I think that this, this idea that we are um, also actively telling the story to try to get people interested in this, um, in this issue. So you also might be sitting there and saying, well, all right, that's one thing in relation to um, the way that the media used to be. But today it's very different. And that's where I'll, I'll point again about this idea of selective exposure, that today it is different. We, we do have more sources available to us than ever before so that we can actively seek out information that agrees with our, with our identities, with our core values. And so I just pulled this off the web of the different um, headlines around the Paris Climate Agreement, which was signed on Earth Day. And so here's one from Fox News, which is known to be a conservative leaning media orga uh, organization. The Paris Climate Agreement is about carbon and confusion. Um, a more general BBC, nations sign historic Paris climate deal, and a lot of them showed John Kerry hugging his granddaughter um, as they signed it. So another one, USA Today, 175 nations sign historic Paris climate deal on Earth Day. So it's much more descriptive, factual. Um, you can also get this on, on social media, so uh, POTUS. Uh, the White House tweeted out, given the urgency of climate change, our nations have signed the Paris Climate Change Agreement. But again, you can go straight over to the Cato Institute and have somebody say that putting our name on an international agreement we all know is a sham doesn't bolster efforts to curb climate change. So the point here is that um, there are traditional ways that media may have exacerbated um, partisan divides. There are traditional, there are ways that media um, might be prone to telling a story and be prone to covering more conflict that has led to an increased belief in um, that uncertainty exists in the science or that dissensus exists. And then today, with the proliferation of media sources and um, the proliferation of social media, 
uh, that people can actively select and filter and go to sources that reify their previous thoughts. And, and again, I can't say that all of the journalists that are out there are necessarily operating by the same ethos that Dorothy Nelkin wrote about in 1987. Um, I had an interesting conversation with some family about that over the weekend. Um, but but this, the point is that we do have more sources than ever to find information that doesn't necessarily disagree with what we believed already. So path forward, um, what do we do about this? Uh, there's been some interesting research that has looked at, so here we've got this partisan divine, how do, we, how do we unstick ourselves from this? And so is this a question of potentially reframing the issue? We talk a lot about it, framing and communication research, so the, uh, the way that we, we tend to talk about issues. And uh, so uh, one question is, is it, is it the way that we name it? Does it have a different effect if we call it climate change? than if we call it global warming? Um, is it a way if we frame it as a public health issue or a weather-related issue? Um, are there different ways that we can find some common ground such that we might be able to um, enter into some civic dialogue? So I thought I'd present you with some of the, the data on, on framing of climate change versus global warming. And this is a study uh, done by one of my colleagues, um, John Schultz and others, where they looked at if you, if you ask people uh, the question uh, in regards to their existence belief, and if you ask them and you say global warming um, or you say climate change, how does it alter their existence belief, if it does? And so this was um, done with a national, uh, national opinion survey. And that if you look at overall, and GW is global warming and CC is climate change, and uh, the, here, I just want to focus in on, on a few numbers on this, on this table. But overall, with the, the general sample, um, that depending upon if you talked about it, do you believe global warming is happening, uh, 67, almost 68% uh, agreed, 74% in climate change agreed. So it was a bit of a bump up with climate change, but not necessarily uh, huge. If we look at the difference uh, between um, Republicans, when you just look at Republicans, you do find in this case that 44% um, versus 60% um, were likely to say that global warming, um, to believe that it has been happening. They were more likely to believe that climate change has been happening. Um, when we look at Democrats, you don't see the effect of the labeling of, of global warming or climate change. But this led to some, um, spurred some very interesting research looking at is it, is it the fact that, that global warming, for instance, people are able to better deny it when um, we have very cold weather? Um, is, is it, is it um, and, and also some supposition that, that in fact Republicans um, preferred to use the term global warming uh, when there were really cold winters as a way to refute that it's occurring because um, indeed how can you say that the earth is warming when we are having um, sub-zero temperatures? So there's, there, um, has been and there continues to be um, some research around this effect of the name of global warming versus climate change. Um, here was another study uh, that was done going back to some Gallup opinion polls uh, that looked at it in relation to um, how much do you worry about global warming versus climate change from party ID. And in this study, which was um, done in 2014, it found not as much difference in Republicans between global warming and climate change with 36 to 39 percent. A few more were worried about climate change um, than global warming. But if you look over at, at Democrats, again, it's about 83 percent. And so there has been some, some discussion about whether or not you're really going to get that much of a change um, through the name uh, that, in, in fact, it's still, it's still very much um, a part of, of, of a belief of, of Republicans, or they're much more motivated uh, to resist irrespective of whether you call it global warming or climate change. But as I said, this is still some ongoing research. Um, so in other words, it's not a panacea to just call it climate change and then everybody's going to agree with you. Um, I mentioned looking at some different frames. There's been some research that's been looking at, well, if, what if we tie it more tangibly to, to us, to people, to ourselves, something that we can connect to. And so uh, 
a fair amount of recent research is looking at framing climate change as having public health impacts. Um, the research suggests that if we talk about it as having environmental health impacts or even sort of affecting animals or um, trees, that it's much less impactful than, it, than if we talk about it in relation to, to us getting sick um, or, or friends or um, our pets getting sick. And this is, again, uh, tied to some of the partisan differences that, that um, have been mentioned previously. And there has been some some, if you will, optimistic research suggesting that tying things, tying climate change to public health connections can increase support for policy mitigation, even among the conservative um, side of the political spectrum. But again, it's not necessarily a panacea. Not all climate change consequences have public health com uh, consequences. And, and indeed, or drawing attention to public health consequences, as in this study we, we um, looked at uh, talking about, we uh, conducted some research out about if you talk about oysters um, as having more vibrio, which is a bacteria that can make um, people very sick if they eat raw or undercooked oysters. And with warming oceans, um, there is an increased likelihood of having vibrio in, um, in oysters. And, if you, uh, and we did find when you talk about that, um, Republicans were more supportive of marine policy to protect um, oysters. But yet, there are perhaps economic consequences of, of um, underscoring that uh, uh, you, know, you shouldn't eat raw oysters because of climate change or global warming because it could um, affect the shellfish industry if people are less likely to, to buy raw oysters. Um, so again, there are some potential uh, downsides to public health framing as well that, needs, that need to be examined further. So what I'd like to wrap up are just some key takeaways from this um, larger talk. Um, and that, you know, one is that, you know, on the good side, I guess, uh, or on the plus side, if you will, that my normative side coming out, most Americans do agree that climate change is occurring. However, individual, social, institutional, and cultural factors might lead them to disavow it. And hopefully we're better prepared to understand what those are after today's um, conversation. Second, this aspect of believing that a scientific consensus exists is so important in terms of predicting people's belief in climate change and then their support for mitigation activities. Um, but that there have been some historical false, false balance uh, evidence in media coverage and selective exposure to sources that has increased doubts in such a consensus. So when we cover the scientific uncertainty about it and the uncertainty about the mechanisms, what we are doing are seeding doubt that it's occurring. And this is, of course, a very challenging area because scientists don't want to come off as being much more certain than they are. We know that we're raised to qualify our science. Um, but what can you say with certainty? And finding what you can say with certainty is important. Um, that's going to be an important takeaway message. And then finally, I would just say that question wording and labeling can influence public opinion data. We don't know how long, necessarily, these effects might last. Um, but they are important to think about how we ask the question, or as we like to say in my field, it's always all about communication. Um, but adoption of only one way to frame the phenomenon is not a panacea, because there may be unintended consequences by this. So just calling it climate change or just talking about the public health impacts, that's not, a, that's not an, an easy, easy takeaway from this. Unfortunately, it is complicated. But I think that if, if we grow more aware and realize that people often have very good reasons for why they disagree with us and trying to identify what those are, often it does come down to the key values and core values that somehow your message is constraining. And so um, with that, I hope that um, you'll ask any questions that you might have, and I thank you for your attention today. Um, climate gate. Yeah. Hello, thank you. Yeah. I uh, have a question about the international scene. Right. Have you just been presenting about the U.S. Uh, right. communication situation in the Pacific Coast? What can you tell us about the, the, the uh, scene in other countries, and what does that tell us about uh, the U.S. versus other?
Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great question. And uh, um, so I am, I am less familiar offhand with, with what I, just a cursory glance, and there have been some uh, polls. And if you were to, for instance, um, uh, Gallup and Pew have both done some international uh, comparisons. So we do know that it has, uh, there have been divides. Australia's had a divide, for instance, that took one politician out of office because of his disavowing that it was existing. So there have been, there have been divides. Um, and I think that the party system, it's, it's often a little bit more complicated when you go to other countries because their party system isn't so, so much divided in between Republicans and Democrats, say, but it, there's often several parties. Um, and so it, it, it doesn't map as easily onto that. Um, I think, though, you know, in relation to the United States, um, I think it's also thinking about the heterogene heterogeneity of the population. And, and um, which can lead itself, um, lead people into having these, yeah, vastly, vastly different views. And, and uh, because it is so heterogeneous, I'm saying this right, uh, I think that it, um, we can see some more of this uh, proliferation of, of a divide, whereas if you have a more homogenous um, population that may rely upon um, fewer sources for information that you may have less of, of that. So certain countries that are, that are smaller and more homogenous may show less of that divide. And then I think that it also comes down to institutional trust and, and who people um, trust for information. And that's going to differ around too. But um, individual countries, it's, uh, there's, there's certainly data out there. But um, I don't think that it as, is as, um, I guess, visible, no, not visible, uh, publicized as the United States, perhaps because of these large-scale international agreements that the United States has, has dragged its heels on, on um, becoming a signatory to that's sort of raised that awareness. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, I guess just how essential do you think communication is? I, it obviously is really important. But, um, like, for instance, we know that obesity is linked to mm -hmm. lack of exercise and poor health uh, diet choices, but people in you know, the United States mm -hmm. have an incredible obesity rate. And mm -hmm. They know the reasons, well, they know the causes for it, mm -hmm. but it hasn't really you know, caused a change in behavior. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that sort of, do you think that should change the way we think about climate change and how to impact change on climate? Right. I think that that's, um, so, so your question is, again, how much can we communicate to the individual to change their belief in climate change? Um, and if it hasn't worked in, in relation to obesity, why would it necessarily work in relation to climate change? To which I would, I, I'm not sure if that's exactly how you, I mean, I guess I would say that in relation to, for instance, obesity, since you brought it up, um, some would argue, or many would argue, that there are also social and structural um, factors that that have influenced um, our, our nation's obesity epidemic. That it's not just blaming the individual, but it's looking at um, there may be individual behavior uh, choices. There are also genetic reasons. Um, but what are some of the uh, structural um, aspects in relation to uh, affordable food and access to healthy food and uh, walkable neighborhoods, and then also institutional factors at play? And so I think that in relation to climate change, um, communication is important. Uh, and, and, I, and I spent a little bit less time talking about strategic communication, just a little bit about the end in terms of how we might go in with messaging to influence uh, people's attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. But I also think that, that these types of approaches have to go um, in line with structural changes, policy changes, um, and larger uh, engineering types of changes. We often talk about it as the three E's of education, enforcement, and engineering, um, that you need to have all three in order to really solve large-scale social problems. So I don't mean to say that it's all about communication, because we also have to have the policies that, motiv that can motivate larger-scale businesses, for instance, to, to adopt cleaner air policies and things like that. So yeah, does that? Thanks. 
a lot. That was really interesting. Um, I wonder if you can talk about relationships to other issues. The ones that keep going through my head because of part of what I study is um, people's skepticism of GOOs and vaccinations. So that these are other scientific issues that there's kind of a, a, a lack of consensus around in the US. And it seems to me like, um, thinking about it very briefly, that if, if we hypothesize that it's people not having faith in science, and they wouldn't believe climate change, they wouldn't believe GMOs are bad, uh, as they are good, and they wouldn't believe that vaccinations are good. Mm -hmm. But if it's a belief that everything about the environment is kind of going to hell in a handbasket, then you would believe climate change is real, but GMOs are bad and vaccinations are bad. So, mm -hmm. so kind of, if you can compare to other controversial mm -hmm. issues, is there is there information you can glean about some of these primary um, values that maybe people are holding on to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, good examples because the vaccine controversy and the GMO um, debate are are often. Um, pointed out as similar to climate change in relation to these uh, problems that there is uh, uh, a, a large scientific consensus about that one thing is, is OK, um, but there may be a number of people in the population that categorically disagree with that. So, um, and interestingly, those, uh, those topics have also been examined for the false balance in media coverage. And uh, there's been research that's shown, uh, for instance, in relation to the autism vaccine link, that, um, that there uh, was a continued um, coverage that, that indeed scientists, um, uh, that there, were, there was more than um, one side, or there wasn't a consensus that, that this link was not occurring. Um, GMOs is a bit more tricky because it's a question of what, what are you focusing in on? Are you focusing in on, on GMOs and the public health um, controversy or the GMO and the environmental health? And so it, it maps a little bit less clearly. But that said, um, we, we do know that there is a large consensus that uh, among scientists or from the AAAS data that, that they believe that um, GMOs are not a public health risk, but there's still a large amount of the population, for instance, that majority of the population that wants their food labeled. And so these things, I think, come down to this question of do scientists, it's not do we understand the, sci the science, and I, again, I, I think that that's important, but do scientists understand people's values too? And we've, um, I think, for a long time felt uh, in some superior ways that, that people should believe the scientists because we know what's best. And I think that we've discounted the, um, the, uh, the, where people are coming from for their reasons. And as I mentioned, the motivated reasoning that we're, we're sort of um, believing that they should be accepting what we're saying because we are the experts, but we're, we're um, disavowing that they may have very good reasons for not accepting what we're saying. And it may not be that they necessarily agree, disagree with the science, but, but adopting that behavior is going to cause a, a change in their lifestyle that they may not want, um, or it, restri it re restrains their freedom in other ways. And so um, telling somebody that they have to vaccinate their child, um, it's this question of who, who do they trust for information? Um, and, uh, and to what extent do they believe that person shares their values? And that, I think, comes in with the genetic um, GMO debate. And I think it's come in a bit with um, climate science, again, is who are people trusting for their information? Does that kind of get at your? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Oh, sure. OK, so one um, WebEx participant um, raises the question that he thinks you're putting too much stock in the ethics and credibility of the mainstream media. Uh, for example, a few examples, it was NBC that housed Brian Williams, Dr. 9-11 tapes, the Trayvon Martin mm -hmm. situation, rig GM, pickup trucks, right. um, all of that. So why should the American public trust the mainstream media? Right. Well, I think that there, um, these are very important points. And, and to be sure, those are egregious examples of why uh, we should be, have a healthy dose of skepticism um, toward, toward the mainstream media. But I could say we could also point out cases of scientists who have, who have had misconduct. <laughs> and so do we, just, do we just throw it all out and say, well, we can't trust scientists, we can't trust the media. I think we need to be discerning of, of our sources and to understand that, um, that all of our sources uh, may be coming from a place of, of bias. And some of it may be more transparent than others. So where are 
where are these, these factors that can lead to um, a bias in media reporting um, or a bias in the science or a bias in, in a particular information source. So I, I think that those are, are good examples. And as I, as I mentioned in my talk, um, this question today with the ever proliferation of blogs and sources, it's hard to know, you know who graduated from a, a, a certified um, journalism school. Um, and, but even so, even if they did, in some of the egregious cases that, um, that uh, the web um, question identified were people who, uh, you know, were, were errors that occurred from people who, who should have known better, you know, who were trained as journalists. But today we've got more and more people who are writing out there um, who, who are not necessarily uh, trained in the norms of objectivity or bias. And so that, again, there, as much as we talk about scientific literacy um, here, we also talk about media literacy in terms of how do we educate people to be critical, um, critical readers and critical observers of media interests to try to understand um, what, is a, what is a good media article and what is a biased media article. And so I think we need to train um, people to be more aware of the potential biases, not only in media, but also in science. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.